Writing the characters was a delight and was very easy and very fun because the movie had such specific and distinctive characters. Each of them had their own style and their own way of speaking, and that was very, very helpful. We basically took the characters from the movie and just extrapolated from there. And, uh, but when you're working with first-class material, it's, uh, it's easy to build upon it. When there's something strange in your neighborhood, it's up to an elite team of Ghostbusters to shed light on the monsters in the dark. Egon, Winston, Peter, Ray, Janine, and even Slimer are armed with their proton packs, PKE meters, ghost traps, and the Ecto-1. When you call, the Ghostbusters come running. Now, take an exclusive look at the creation of the indelible heroic characters of the long-running and popular animated series, The Real Ghostbusters. Witness their transition from feature film to world-renowned animation stars. Who you gonna call? The heroes of The Real Ghostbusters. When I first came on the show, uh, there was some question about how the characters would look and, re and reinterpret them because there was some question of can we use the likenesses of the original actors or do they have to look different? And the consensus was we should make them different enough to be their own characters, but still recognizable from the film, which is a very hard thing to try and work out. They can't all be guys in gray suits with dark hair. So we took each of them and gave them a little bit of instant identification. It helps in animation anyway. I mean, when they're running across the screen small, it helps to tell, tell them apart. So we made one blonde and gave a peaked hair and you know, did that kind of thing. But the different color suits, Partly, that in animation, in a group scene, you could figure out who was who. I think the Ghostbusters is a perfect example of a really well-constructed ensemble, because you have Venkman, who is the, the you know, he's this, this dry wit, and he's, he's also your cynical, iconoclastic skeptic. You have Ray, who's so enthusiastic about everything that he doesn't really think about unintended consequences, and, and his enthusiasm is infectious. Then you have uh, Egon, who's your mad scientist, but the heroic mad scientist. He's not, you know, evil. He's, but he's just so involved with building the next thing that uh, sometimes he's lost touch with the rest of the world. I have sold my soul to a minor demon. I have sold my soul to a minor demon. Winston is, is a very difficult character to write because he's your everyman point of view. He's the only normal one of these guys. And so uh, he represents, uh, he represents uh, the handle by which the audience identifies with, you know, you look through Winston's eyes. They were great characters to write for, and the actors you knew would just give you a great line reading on everything. Even if you didn't expect it to be that way, they would do good. Yes, a multi-dimensional cross rip of hyperbolic intensity, hitherto unknown within the visible spectrum of Egon. I love it when you talk like that. I liked writing Egon of all the characters probably the most, Ray being second, uh, because his personality is most like my own. Uh, he's, he, he lives too much in his own head, he's too far from his own emotions, and he's naive but in a way that says, I believe in what I'm doing. Uh, there's, there's this real charm about the character by virtue of what he does do and what he can't do. He's afraid to touch emotion, and that makes him appealing. I just kind of zeroed in just on that sort of glottal pullback that Harold had as the character and everything being very, very flat, and, um, you know, just, just worked off the Egon characterization, because I know Harold's a little more loose than Egon. Um, but. Yeah, it was just a, it was just a question of working off my what I imagine it would be like to be this sort of you know all this intelligence contained in this sort of deadpan just outside the stream of life sort of fellow who you know done. kind of I always thought within Egon both Ramus's Egon and mine there was this longing to kind of belong a little bit more and uh, be one of the guys. The thing about Egon that we always thought is he's the guy that's gonna come up with a scientific explanation for everything, but you know he hasn't changed his underwear in a week. No. It just doesn't matter to him. He was kind of the early geek. When I was writing for Egon Spengler, it was kind of 
difficult not to think of him as a blonde Mr. Spock, in a way. And, and that was kind of in the back of my mind, but he wasn't exactly Mr. Spock. But he was certainly that same kind of a character. He was rational, he was scientific, he was reason-driven. He was not unemotional, but as his interactions with Janine showed, he was not really sophisticated in emotional relationships. Oh, wow! Hey, Winston, this is where they make all the deadly Dr. Crowley movies. Ray Stance is the common man in these things. Uh, he's got his enthusiasms and all that, but in the end, he's very solidly grounded. Uh, and I think that's what makes, makes him an entertaining character. Ray was a 10-year-old stuck in a scientist's body. Yes. He got excited about everything. If they, if they got blown out of the air, did you see how they did that? Wasn't that great? Well, we're falling to our deaths. Yes, but wasn't it great the way they blew our plane out of the air? He wants something really big to fight, which is the last thing the rest of them want to do because they're there to run a business and make a buck. Ray would like to go fight ghosts on other planets if he could. Why not? Frank Welker as a voice actor didn't really, you know, uh, change his voice much for Ray. When you hear Frank Welker talk, that is Ray's stance. But what that kind of enables him to do is be so even more natural than, uh, you know, any other actor putting on a voice or an impersonation. So what you got with Ray was, uh, and Frank Welker, was just this wonderfully rounded character who was actually quite rounded until the later seasons when they slimmed him down. I've worked with Frank Welker for many years. Frank Welker, in my opinion, is He's kind of the president of our club. He's kind of the king. Everyone loves him. He is the consummate gentleman. Ray is the everyman. Ray is the guy, the nice guy. He's, he's smart and all that, but he's really just, he's really a super nice guy. And, and I suppose that's why Slimer was particularly, you know, um, attached to Ray, because Ray would never think to, you know, make fun of Slimer, like, certainly like Peter would. Ray was really the one of those who would look into the eyes of a ghost and see that ghost was in torment and say, you know, I want to help this guy. I don't want to, I don't want to bust him. I want to, I'll risk my life to help him because that's what you do as a human being. And that really, to me, summed up Ray's stance. Do you talk about the loons and the scoundrels in your family tree? If I didn't, I wouldn't have anybody to talk about. Peter Venkman, as a kid, was the, uh, the character I most wanted to be. He was this uh, good-looking, uh, statuesque kind of chap with a really cool pointed hairstyle, although in some different animation studios he'd be kind of curled, but <laughs> that was Venkman, and uh, he was just the smart mouth. You always wanted to be him. Good looking chap, and just the, the wittiest things would come out of his mouth. Even as a kid, you could appreciate that. You know, it was just, he was always getting out of situations uh, with his cleverness, I guess. I felt close to Venkman. He, 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 Venkman was a philosophical anarchist. Nothing made sense to him except, you know, where am I going to eat? How much money am I going to make from it? And can I go on vacation this year? Everything else was a joke. Peter Venkman was so much fun to write for because you could have him say anything. And the way Lorenzo Music would deliver it, you wouldn't hate him for it. You would laugh and you would know that it was really just his way, just his way, that underneath he really was kind of a soft-hearted guy, but he just didn't like to show that. Lorenzo Music was chosen as Peter Venkman because he was kind of a dry, acerbic, you know, he was the comic relief. He'd, he'd come up with the comments, you know. So he was funny. And uh, he had that just attitude, you know. I remember when I, I had just started directing. I wasn't so established at that point. And I, I think I was over directing him in the beginning. And he wrote me a note and said, you don't have to tell me anything except faster louder or softer he goes I'll, I'll take care of everything else so i stopped over directing him and he was fine <laughs>